good afternoon, everyone. Have we started to rejoice yet? <laughs> well, appreciate you coming out for the Bible study in the afternoon. I know it's always kind of uh, difficult to go out and have a nice meal and then come back and uh, sit down and go to services again. I think most of the ministry learn to ter- ter- learn to talk and people sleep anyway. That's kind of an act. Can't learn to do that. So, but I'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and open in prayer, and we'll go ahead and begin. Father in heaven, we just thank you for the blessing of your word, the scriptures. Father, we thank you that the special time we have here at the feast to not only fellowship and to eat and to partake of delicious food together, but also to be together as God's people and to study your word and to be fed by your word. And we just ask that you would help the words of God that we will be studying today to refresh our life, to truly be a time of refreshing and a time of uplift, and hopefully that uh, we will be able to uh, take some of the understanding that we see in the scriptures home with us to bless and to strengthen us the rest of the year. And we just ask for your blessing and inspiration uh, as we study these words. And we just ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, one of the delightful blessings that Jet and I both have as we come to Myrtle Beach each year is the rainfall you have out here. We uh, are from New Mexico, and we live in a high desert area. And believe me, when we moved out from Tennessee back in the 50s, it was quite, <laughs> quite a transition to come from all the humidity and rain we had in Tennessee, land of the green, you know. And to come to New Mexico, beautiful area, but we only get probably 8 to 11 inches of rain a year. And so uh, we love the rainfall. I really love the rain. It's really, it's really uh, quite a blessing, and we enjoy that as we come out, even though I know this is an area that's prone to hurricanes and that type of situation. We really do enjoy the rainfall. But even in the area that we live in, we do have a monsoon season, a rainy season, which starts about later part of June, July, August, some, reaches into September. And that particular time of the year, we receive a, a lot of rainfall. Well, one year we had a church picnic scheduled after the Sabbath. We would were, we were occasionally go up to a beautiful area in the Rocky Mountains. We had an area we went to called Pine Flats. And we'd use that uh, several times throughout the year to have a picnic at and didn't take into consideration that the monsoon season was just starting. And I was directing, you have to realize I was directing the whole, the whole uh, picnic. And so we had just got up there after Sabbath services. It's probably 4 o'clock in the afternoon, maybe. And we had a deluge of rain. Everybody had just got the food out on the table. And we had, and what I forgot to mention is I had not got a picnic ground with a pavilion. You know, because we don't need them that often in New Mexico, but we needed it that day. So we got a good soaking, and uh, I wasn't the most popular guy for a couple hours, but uh, but a few weeks later, we had another picnic, and I had the foresight to go out, and I rented a, cost us a little more money, but it's well worth it, I rented a, a picnic uh, area with a pavilion. Sure enough, we got up there, and the rain began to fall, and we got we came, security. We came up underneath the pavilion where we had our food and just enjoyed the beautiful, you know, soothing rainfall as it, as it poured outside. And that was, uh, you know, nothing more comfortable than being in a place of security when it's raining. I know when I was used to h- hike in the Rocky Mountains as a teenager and a young boy, I sometimes just start raining. I find a cave or an overhang or maybe a a grove of trees where I could seek refuge, and it's, it's comfortable, it's, it's soothing. Well, the amazing truth is that in the King James Bible, we find that God's Word speaks of God, of God as being our pavilion. I want you to notice, and it's very meaningful as we begin to observe the Feast of Tabernacles. Notice Psalms, the 27th chapter, Psalms 27. 
in verse 5. Because we'll be looking at a very special, meaningful truth, I hope, will have great import for us in our life, in our Christian walk. Notice it tells us here, Psalms 27 and verse 5, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. And the Hebrew word there is sukkot, sometimes uh, in plural announced as sukkot. In the, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, he shall set me upon a rock. And it tells us in Psalms, the 18th chapter, notice. Very poetic uh, expressions that David uses. You, know, you can just... His faith and the confidence that God had built into his life because of the experiences he had with faith has come bleeding through the text. And he tells us in Psalms 18, I will love you, O Lord, my might. It's interesting because you'll find this occurrence recorded again uh, back in First Sam, back in the book of. Uh, for Samuel, and you you won't find this is this is a replication of his words there in the book of Samuel. But what's but what is interesting is is that you don't find this first sentence. I will love you, O Lord, my might, my strength. I will love you, O Lord, my strength. And so what you find is you consider when this was first written that that particular first sentence is not in the text. Obviously, David had grown in his love for God. So this was added later on. But the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. And he says in verse 6, he says, In my distress I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple. And my cry came before him, even unto his ears. And then the earth shook and trembled. The fountain, the foundations also of the hills moved and were shaken because he was wroth. And there went a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down, and darkness was upon his feet. He rode upon a cherub, and did fly. Yes, he did fly upon the wings of his of the wind. He made the darkness his secret place, his pavilion. Around about him were dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Now the uh, New American Standard in First Kings eighteen here trans actually actually translates it. As canopy, the amplified version in Psalms 27:5 that we just read translates that particular word that's used for shelter or pavilion as shelter, tabernacle. Uh, NIV also translates it as tabernacle. And then we read here in Psalms the 31st chapter. Psalms 31 and verse 20 David again here is saying you shall hide them in the secret of your presence from the pride of man you shall keep them secretly in, in a pavilion from the strife of the tongues and again uh, that's translated in various ways by different translators shelter, tabernacle and it actually What's so amazing about what we're studying is actually the Hebrew word is Sukkot. It's Sukkot. And what's interesting to note is 5521 in the original Hebrew, it's, it's the identical word that's used 
for tabernacles or booths here in, in uh, Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. Leviticus 23. Where it tells us that in verse 40, And you shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, the branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and the willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord. Actually, it's interesting because the Hebrew there means in the original Hebrew is before the face of the Lord. Giving this, this picture that we all need to understand. We all need to be able to see that, that, that spiritually at the Feast of Tabernacles, we come before the very presence and before the very face of God. You know how special that is. And... What's striking as well is the word Sukkot actually is pronounced, uh, I think, in the, in the singular. Well, in the original Hebrew, it's Sukkah, and then they, they pronounce it also Sukkot or if, in the singular, like to dwell in your Sukkot, or Sukkot, Feast of Sukkot for Feast of Booths, in the plural. But what's interesting is the original Hebrew actually for Sukkot actually means to weave. And what it's talking about, to weave together, what it's talking about is the, the interleaving, the interweaving of the trees and the branches that were, that were gathered and pruned at the Feast of Tabernacles. One little help, uh, I'm not a Hebrew scholar by any means, but one little help to you when you, you get a Strong's Concordance and you look up some of these Hebrew nouns is that Hebrew is a very active language. It springs from the radix or the root of a verb, of course, which connotes action. So you'll see that when you study the Hebrew, that, that the, 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 the uh, verbal root, it's always a very, a very active word. That's what it means to weave together. And they would actually would, it was the way they pruned their crops, and they actually uh, would go out. It was a very family-oriented oriented activity. They would go out with the children, and they would basically harvest a lot of the trees in that area or prune them to make these booths with. And a uh, very meaningful word. It was very much a family a family activity. You know, it's important that our children be involved in the Feast of Tabernacles as well, which I know that certainly they do strive to do in the Church of God International. But it's striking because the, the truth of the Feast of Tabernacles is really very much like a multifaceted gem. And it's like, you, you know, you hold the truth up and you see it under a different, a different perspective and a different viewpoint. And you begin to see the, the feast, you look at it and there's always some new perspective or some new uh, glimmer of truth that you may not have seen before. And that's how, you know, why, what, one thing that makes God's truth so, so relevant, so important, so, so uh, interesting uh, but what we see here is a truth. Is, it's not a new truth, but it is an old truth that sometimes we perhaps don't consider as often as we should. And certainly, you know, God's truth so many times it's, it's like being buried there, but God gives it, you know, enables us to look at it from a fresh perspective. But what we see here is another truth and insight about the Feast of Tabernacles. That is, we dwell in temporary sh shelters or booths or pavilions for eight days. We are demonstrating the great protection that God gives us as temporary sojourners on the way to his kingdom. Because, you know, certainly we will tabernacle with God for eternity in heavenly Jerusalem, but now, now we need protection. Now we need encouragement and strength. And so we see that great uh, truth here demonstrated by the Feast of Tabernacles. I mean, to know, I mean, that God's face is looking down upon us, that we are under his canopy of blessing and protection, and you know, how wonderful, how wonderful that is. And we're going to need a place of refuge on our way to God's kingdom. And God's church, as a uh, 
representative of Christ's spiritual body as he dwells within us is also a part of this security, a part of this protection that we we need God's people because in many ways, I, I remember when I first started uh, attending the Feast of Tabernacles back when I was just, a, you know, my parents were not in the church. I began attending when I was still in high school and uh, how difficult it was. And I remember, boy, when I got to church, I needed that refuge. I needed that encouragement and, and solace. And, and it was just important to something I really desired. It's easy to take that for granted, you know, as we, uh, you know, grow in our years in the church. But certainly, we as, we as God's people that are filled with the Spirit of Christ. You know, Christ tabernacles in us, and we tabernacle in Him. And he, He's in us, and we're in Him. And Christ is in the Father, this wonderful relationship. Well, we should strive to be a source of solace and a source of encouragement to God's people as well. So we see, we see this meaning that God is our provision and our refuge and our shelter on our journey to God's kingdom. And it certainly, certainly is encouraging. Well, today we're going to study and consider a beautiful psalm that speaks of that, that refuge and protection, Psalms, the 46th chapter, Psalms 46. The psalm really has quite a history. It really has quite a history in it. It's an interesting study. It's been called Luther's Psalm because we know that uh, Martin Luther, though he did not have all of God's church, a truth, I mean, certainly he, he was a major springboard for during the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. He saw many of the abuses of the Catholic Church, and his life was threatened many, many times, and he lived under a great deal of stress, but yet he was a great student of the Scriptures. And uh, the, the, he wrote the, the hymn, of course, that we sing, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And uh, I think some of, we, I know we have it in our hymnal. Probably some of you have it in yours. But I, I remember years ago a certain trial our whole church went through uh, and singing this hymn and the tears streaming down our face. You know, Mighty Fortress is Our God. It's a tremendous hymn. You know, so much uh, history and so much... Uh, truth, and it is an interesting study to study the history of some of the hymns. I hope, however, that you will come to call Psalms 46 your psalm as well. I hope that it will become very meaningful to you throughout the years as you open the Bible and you see Psalms 46 and how wonderful, how wonderful it is. A psalm you can go to to cheer you up, to strengthen you, to, to encourage you when times are difficult. And certainly, when we talk about refreshment and enjoyment and rejoicing, uh, God's Word is a way that we can be caused, be strengthened, in the di a, a dynamic that can be used to uh, cause us to rejoice. You know, George Mueller was a uh, man that I've got just about every book that's been written on George Mueller, I think. But he was an outstanding example of prayer during the 1800s. And he had an orphanage that he ran for 60 years basically on his knees. And uh, never asked for a donation. So many inspiring stories he told. But he had a lot of spiritual advice in his books as well. And he said that he had learned that one of the greatest helps to his prayer life was when he would begin praying was to read a psalm on his knees or to read scripture as he began to pray. And he said oftentimes the words and the emotions of that, that uh, psalm would, would just develop and flow into a prayer. But, you know, the important, you know, the situation, this is really a good tool. You know, Wayne talked about he worked with his um, tools, the way he made his living. I make my living with tools. I'm a, I'm a client's repair technician, so a good tool, I mean, it's pretty, it's important. I mean, uh, anybody who works with their hands loves a good tool. This is a good tool that you can use. Uh, it's so difficult at times when we want to maintain a good prayer life. We get on our knees and we have all these distractions that are about us and these things pulling at us, and, and, and oftentimes 
opening up the Word of God and just simply reading a psalm and allowing God's Spirit through His Word to calm you and to get you more focused. It's just a great tool. And uh, I just mentioned that because I think it's something that you might, uh, you know, a, a practice you might, you might find effective, and certainly George Mueller found it effective. I found it effective myself. But Psalms 46 is a monumental psalm. It really is. Martin Luther, as I said, obviously did not have all the truth. Uh, he, he had a companion that was in his life. You know, he, he was a monk. And he didn't have a wife that he could uh, have consolation in. And oftentimes God does provide our friends. And Martin Luther had a friend called Philip Melanchthon during the Reformation. And he was a very erudite man. He was very scholarly. He was a tremendous man of the scriptures. And, and Martin Luther would, would oftentimes uh, console one another, encourage one another. And it was said that oftentimes when they were going through a difficult time, that Martin Luther would say, come, Philip, let us read the book of Psalms 46. That's what my, that's what my wife does sometimes. I'll, I'll come home, and uh, something she wants to break to me gradually Maybe a bill we got in the mail or something. And she'll say, come, Philip, let us read Psalms 46. You know, I just say that jokingly. She usually just has a, an ominous look on her face. <laughs> you better sit down. But anyway, but he was certainly, uh, Psalms 46 was very important to Martin Luther because there were, Periods in his life, as there are in all of our lives, when, you know, David says, you know, why am I downcast, oh, my soul? And, you know, we have to be honest with God. There are times when we're downcast, and if we're downcast, we're downcast. And uh, God knows how we feel. It, Psalms 46 is part of a little cluster of psalms. If you study, you'll notice that there's a little cluster of psalms, Psalms 46, Psalms 47, Psalms 48, that are very much millennial psalms. They speak of, of God reigning and Christ reigning as king over the earth on Mount Zion from the city of Jerusalem. You'll notice in Psalms 46, in verse 4, that it speaks of the city of God. And you'll notice, jumping a psalm over, in Psalms 47 and verse 2, where it says, For the Lord Most High is terrible. He has a great king over the earth. Millennial, definitely a, a millennial uh, passage. In verse 7, For God is the king of all the earth. Sing you praises with understanding. Verse 8, Psalms 47, verse 8, God reigns over the heathen. God sits upon the throne of his holiness. And notice... In Psalms 48, 1 through 3, this third cluster of Psalms I'm talking about, where it says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of God, in the mountain of his holiness. Beautiful for the situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. That, of course, Jerusalem, understand, was built upon Mount Zion, so that was oftentimes another name for Jerusalem, was Mount Zion. Is the city of the great king, and God is known in her places for a refuge. It's vital and it's uplifting to understand that Zion and Jerusalem is built upon the hill of Zion and is a type also of God's church and of his people. Jerusalem and Zion is a type of God's church, his people, that is us. So, really, very meaningful. Meaningful as you study Scripture to realize that that uh, the Zion and Jerusalem to be a type of God's church. So, so many of these scriptures will have more relevance to you. You will notice, for example, over in Hebrews, the twelfth chapter. Hebrews 12, and verse 22. We're, you know, Paul trying to inspire us as to, you know, when we pray, this is what we're coming before. This is, this is what we worship before. 
He wants to get our minds to think bigger and, and greater. He says, but you're not coming to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. But you are coming to, excuse me, you're coming to, you're coming to the Mount Zion and to the city of the living God and the heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to judge God, the, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. And we read in Revelation, the 14th chapter, Revelation 14. In verse 1, and I looked, Revelation 14 and verse 1, and a lamb standing on the Mount Zion, and with him and 140 and 40,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. And then, of course, Revelation 22, speaking of the New Jerusalem. Uh, Revelation 20, excuse me, Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the, the body of New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I heard a great voice out of heaven say, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. But the reality of it is, is that right now, that we as God's church are spiritual Jerusalem. And God does tabernacle with us through his spirit. And he is a source of protection for us, and a, and a, a great source of, of solace and consolation and and uh, the wonderful relationship that we have with God. The Feast of Tabernacles, of course, was established. Originally, eventually, they were required to go to Jerusalem for the feast. That's where the, the temple was set up. That's where the, the ark and the temple dwelt. The ark, of course, symbolic of Jesus Christ and his presence. And we as God's people, as tabernacles of his spirit, again, we are spiritual Jerusalem. And so that's an important, important revelation that we need to hold in mind. You notice in the, Bible, in the King James Bible, going back to Psalms 46, usually the upper uh, subscript here is by the King James translators, their assessment of the psalm. And then the lower part usually was the some debate as to when it was put into the Hebrew text, some argument that possibly it was inspired as well. I believe certainly it was. But you will find that something interesting here. Psalms 46 where the, the King James translators were able to ever t able to discern that this was the confidence which the church has in God. We are called to be a confident people. You know, God intends us to be confident in what we can do and getting God's work done. And we're not we're called to have faith and to have confidence and to and to, and to believe that through Christ's Spirit we can do what He's called us to do. Not arrogant, not presumptuous, but nevertheless confident that, that we can, uh, through God's Spirit, do the work that He's called us to do, and to accomplish the live the life that He's called us to do. You'll notice in the subscript, and actually this is um, actually obviously from the Hebrew writers. He gave it titles. To the chief musician, the song of Korah. And that's interesting because obviously, you know, no, no one but the chief musician should have been entrusted with such a beautiful psalm. 
But it's important to understand the truth that sometimes I don't think we stop to consider. We know that in the original Hebrew, the, the book of Psalms, actually, the Hebrew title was called Sefer, Sefer Tehillim. I'm probably butchering the Hebrew, but it means book of praises. And essentially, it was Israel's hymn book. We get the word Psalms from the Greek Septuagint, which means to pluck. You know, a song, song with accompaniment, you know, the plucking of strings. But the Hebrew, it was Sefer Tehillim, the, the, the book of praises. But spiritually, let's stop and consider who really was the chief musician? Really? Who inspired uh, David to write? You know, David, it's attributed to David that he wrote 73 of the Psalms. I think probably he wrote more. Moses, too, is ascribed, is, is, uh, uh, ascribed to Moses. But, you know, all Scripture, of course, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16 is given by inspiration of God. is, is God-breathed. And we know that clearly, and we read over... Second Peter, Second Peter one, Second Peter one and verse twenty, where it says that Second Peter one and verse twenty, knowing this first that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private or individual interpretation, for the prophecy and of course realize in the Bible, uh, the Hebrew word prophet tuo. It was a speaking forth. It was not only a, a foretelling, but it was also very much a, a, a foretelling of, of the will of God. Not only, not only a foretelling, but a foretelling. For the prophecy came not to old time by the will of men, but, but holy men of, of, of spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Or, or moved by the, they say ghost, but it should be spirit. So what we have to what we have to understand, what really makes I mean the song is much more meaningful. Realize the chief musician, the chief composer was Jesus Christ. He's the one who inspired these words. And understand and realize when we when we open these words up and we begin to read them, these are Christ words. These are what He wants to cheer us up with. This is what He wants to strengthen us with. It just makes it so much more meaningful. And our chief musician, our chief composer through the inspired words of God uh, in the book of Psalms is able to speak to us and to cheer us up. No wonder, no wonder Paul said, you know, we ask, well, we are, you know, Paul told Timothy, stir up the gift of God. No wonder Paul encouraged us with these words in Ephesians 6. Verse 18, Ephesians 6 and verse 18. And be not drunk with wine where it is excess, but to be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And here we are being encouraged with the words of the psalmist David. And you can recall when he was called in to to sing and play his instrument to King Saul and how it says the, the evil spirit left him and, and he was refreshed. Well, certainly it's a powerful, Psalms is a powerful book. It can, it can give us powerful help in being able to deal with the depressions we go through and perhaps a wrong spirit or attitude that we're in. And uh, it's just a, a powerful book that, that we can go, and no wonder, no wonder it's, so, it's such so powerful because it's Christ, it's Jesus Christ that inspired these words. And uh, what a great resource that we do have. It says upon Alamoth, uh, some debate as to what that means. Thought to mean a song pitched to the high or soprano voices of the Hebrew virgins. You will recall, of course, that when Miriam went out after they had crossed the Red Sea, that her and the women saying praises to God. You can recall 1 Samuel 18 and verse 6, 1 Samuel 18 and verse 6, when the women came out to, to sing praises to God after David had defeated Goliath. 
So obviously, it was a more than likely a song to very high pitch. It was a very upbeat song. It wasn't. It wasn't a, a meant to be a moroseful song at all. It's to lift us up, lift our spirits. It tells us again in Psalms forty six. In verse one, God is our refuge. And a strength, a very present help in trouble. Well, how wonderful a place of refuge is. They said that Lawrence of Arabia, uh, with his battle you know, against the Turks, with the, the, some of the great stories of exploits, his exploits, but he had, a, he had a refuge out there in the Arabian desert somewhere. It was all stocked up with supplies and with weapons, and he would often retreat to that refuge for solace and to, to kind of regain his strength. And so we have a place of refuge in Christ, and how how wonderful how wonderful that is. Moses and Elijah had a refuge. I won't take time to take to some of these passages, but First Kings nineteen and verse one it talks about how Elijah was up in the cleft or a cave of the rock when God began to deal directly with him. It said that Moses was up in a cleft, like a cave or a place of protection when. When he saw the backside of God, recorded there in the book of Exodus. And David often sought refuge. Uh, there were many limestone caves between the, uh, uh, the country of Judah and the, and the, and the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea. And so oftentimes David would find a refuge there. You will notice Psalms 57. Notice the, the Hebrew subscript here, second little paragraph above the Psalm 57, says, To the chief physician, Mitchum of David, when he fled from Saul in the cave. And he's, he was talking about, Be merciful to me, O God, be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you. Yes, in the shadow of your wings will I make my refuge and these calamities be overpassed. You know what a, what a, how God inspired David to be so figurative and so poetic and so inspiring in his language and he just thought of himself being under the shadow of God's wings in this wonderful place of protection. It says God is a very present help. Remember his name, Emmanuel, Matthew 1 and verse 23, God with us, a very present help in time of trouble. I have to, I have to ask myself, when is, it, when is a Christian not in trouble? I mean, someone compared to Christian is, Christian is like a uh, key, ke key kettle uh, up to his neck in hot water and singing. You know? It's one of the greatest, greatest helps we have. Uh, you know, it's to sing and sing and to thank God and praise God and, and to stay cheered up with his help. Because, I mean, it's like we just exchange one problem for another one. I mean, we go through one trial and then there's something, something else we have to deal with. So we have, and one of the great helps and reliefs we can have that is, is the book of Psalms. Inspiring story, Daniel 3, of how God... Christ was always is always with us. You recall the story, sparring story of how the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down to the image of Nebuchadnezzar, and they were thrown into the fiery furnace. But this inspiring insight we have here in Scripture. But Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar 3 and verse 25, the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spoke and said unto his counselors, did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? And the answer said, true, O king. He answered, says, lo, I see four men walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the son of man, Emmanuel, God with us. I, I will share with you a story that... that I'm always glad I heard it. We had a, we heard a, had a man that had left the church years ago back in the 70s. It was not for 
doctrinal problems. It was a problem of morality. He had a legitimate reason as to why he was unable to attend church anymore. But he was a friend of mine. I saw him one day, and I decided to stop and talk to him. I've never forgot what he told me. He said, Phil, he said, I want to tell you something. You will never, ever understand how much help God has given you until you leave the church, you leave God. He says, I, I, all these things I took for granted, and now I, I see that I don't have them anymore. He saw he was no longer under God's protection. And there's so many things I know that we take for granted. You know, my wife and I long ago, my wife has her Ebenezer book, where she recalls, you know, I won't take time to go on that story, but her stones of help, you know, uh, Samuel, uh, after, their, after the battle of the Philistines, they set up a, song, a stone called the Ebenezer stone. The, the Lord has helped us. And the times God intervenes for us should be Ebenezer's in our life. It should encourage us. And my wife has and uh, her Ebenezer book where she puts, records the times that God has intervened in our life. And I have... Every day when I pray, I also have a, another good tool. I have a, a little notebook where I have a place for prayer request. You know, God's interventions that happened the day before, his blessings, and they're always there. Like that man, they're always there if you look for them. And then uh, I have God's people I'm praying for. And believe me, you will pray for a lot more people if you'll write it down. And I will have that, and then prayer requests, our needs. And, but it is, it, that's another good tool you can have. I know I, I have a mind that I have a tendency for kind of a shotgun mind. I'll be trying to pray, and I'll be thinking about this and that. But I find that if I have these prayer requests written down and, and specific things I'm going to pray about God to God for, it really is helpful. It's another good tool you can have. But, you know, brethren often grow discouraged. I hear this all the time. Well, we don't have any of the great leaders we used to have. We don't have, uh, we don't have uh, Herbert Armstrong and, uh, and uh, his son, and they're no longer preaching, and we can't get the work done. You know, God is the God of the living. He's alive. The living Christ that we have that dwells amongst his people, he's still there. He's still there, and we have to have that confidence of that. You know, it's been said that he that will live in the spirit of the psalm will be fearless. Second Timothy 1 and verse 7, you know, Paul encouraged Timothy, God has not given us a spirit of fear. And oftentimes, another synonym for fear is worry and anxiety. I'm sure probably all of us struggle with it, but we can do better with Christ's spirit. And he goes on to tell us here... Um, so he progressed through the psalm. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. It's talking about great earth-wide calamities, earthquakes, you know, hurricanes, tidal waves. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. And it says Salah. Some debate about that particular word. Some mean it believes to pause, to rest, and to think about what's, just kind of digest what you've read. Uh, you know, the Amplified Version, I think they translate it, you know, stop and think on this. One of the other beliefs this word means to lift up the voice higher in force. But it is a, certainly a pause. But, you know, you stop to think about it. You know, Jerusalem actually um, didn't have a lot of earthquakes. Not a lot. It was located sort of in the, the bottom of this amphitheater of, of hills, which gave it a certain amount of protection. And, uh, but occasionally, it would have an earthquake. And... Uh, you know, we see Christ talked about how the increase of earthquakes before his return. Sometimes there can be earthquakes in the church, can't there? 
I mean, I think some of us lived through some earthquakes <laughs> back in the 90s. It's interesting because I've said the song has the psalm has some interesting history. It said that there was a great earthquake during the 1850s, I believe, over in London, and it was said that John Wesley, that buildings were falling over. Of course, they didn't have earthquake buildings back then. People were terrified and running around in fear that John Wesley quietly gathered around him a small group of people in a chapel, and he calmly read to them Psalms 46 to calm them down. It isn't striking how things, sometimes horrific things, can work together for good. You'll notice what happened at the time of Christ's crucifixion. Psalms, the 26th chapter, verse 50. Psalms 27, excuse me, verse 50. Psalms 27, 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, he lifted up the spirit. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent and twain two from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and the many of the bodies of the saints which slept arose. But we know that the, the, the veil that was rent at that time symbolized that now that mankind would be able to go through Christ into the Holy of Holies to God the Father, other Bible study, but go into the, the holy place of God the Father with their petitions through the blood and sacrifice of Christ. And what's interesting is, is that the veil in, in that Herodian temple, the one that Herod built, it was 70 feet high, it was 30 feet wide, it was four inches thick. I mean, you might think it's just some little small veil. It was a huge veil, and it rent all the way from the top to the bottom. And they, it was so strong, they said they actually took ten yoke of oxen to see if it could tear it apart. It was not unable to rend the veil, but it was rent during that earthquake. And it symbolized this great, great, wonderful liberty that we have. I mean, I've heard people give sermons on calling God on the telephone. I think it used to be a hymn about that. It doesn't do much for me. What really I think is inspiring is this, this truth that we have here in this encouragement that because of that, because of the rending of that veil and that symbolism that now we can go into the holy place spiritually that the high priest was unable to go to. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may, or with liberty, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well, what, a, what an insight that, that when we pray, we, we need to get that imagery that we are coming into the very throne of God an innumerable company of angels. I mean, that's, that's inspiring. Great powers that God has given us through the liberty that we have in Christ. Psalms 46 and verse 3. Psalms 46 and verse 3. We go back. Or excuse me, let's go ahead and go to verse 4. There's a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles most high. Wow, what a picture we have here. You know, Christ would tell us over in John 6, over in the book of John 6. No, excuse me, John 7. John 7, verse 37. In that last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And he that believes on me... As the scripture saith, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. 
And so we know, you know, you, you can recall the circumstance when Hezekiah built a, from a, from a pool on the hillside, uh, ran an underground tunnel called Hezekiah's Tunnel underneath the, the walls of Jerusalem down to the Pool of Siloam, and which meant basically the word in the Hebrew meant sent because this is, it was sent, the, the pools of Siloam were sent out for uh, drinking and refreshment. But what's interesting is we, we have this picture here that, that there is a great river that's flowing through God's church. It's the river and the streams of God's truth, living water. And we're going to have it at the Feast of Tabernacles, living water flowing through God's church, strengthening us, refreshing us, hydrating us. And sometimes, you know, it's like if, if, if one river fails, you, another, one stream fails you, one stream, if stream fails to give you the help you need, there's another stream flowing. I remember John Keyes that worked with Herbert Armstrong back in the 30s. He, he uh, heard him speak when you were at the Feast of Tabernacles. I remember he made the comment, he says, you know, most of you here have heard much about the law, but you sure haven't heard much about redemption. And he said, and you're thirsty. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I'm thirsty. Because we have that stream flowing through God's church as well. Redemption, grace. But on the, conversely, we also, obedience. Obeying the commandments of God, the holy days, which gladden the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles most high. Well, what? I mean, we're the city of God. And there's flowing within us, and it will flow throughout the Feast of Tabernacles. It'll flow, this, it'll flow through this morning. It'll flow through God's, through this whole Feast of Tabernacles, lifting us up and ensuring us all and gladdening our hearts. You know, what a, what a blessing we have. God is in the midst of her. And she shall not be moved. God shall help her that right early. It's interesting because the King James Version translates it that, it, that when the morning appeareth, many believe that the resurrection will happen in the morning. Certainly it would seem logical. But we know that God is, you know, he's always on time. I mean, we, we, we may not... We may not realize what's going on in God's church. People get discouraged. They see all the fragmentation and wonder, you know, what's going to happen to us? Or are we just going to be like an old folks' home? We're all going to die out and, and there won't be a church? No, that's not going to happen. One of the most encouraging scriptures you read time and time again in the Word of God is eternal reigneth. Eternal reigneth. It's interesting because... The Spanish, in one of their translations, says, God will help us when the, when the sun comes up. God is always going to be there. He's faithful. may not be on our, our timetable. It says in Psalms 37 and verse 7, it's, it's a tremendous faith that we need to have, a resting faith. Sometimes we don't have that kind of faith. We have a, we have a uh, I remember years ago, a man uh, uh, was telling me he was praying to God, I want my blankety blessings. He was mad because he hadn't got them. He wasn't, it's an antithesis of everything God expects in us. Faithfulness and patience. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself because of, of him who prospers in his way because of man who brings the, uh, the vices to, to pass. Fret in the Lord, I mean, rest in the Lord, not fret in the Lord, uh, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. I remember reading a story, and there are some inspiring stories even amongst some of people out there that don't have the truth of the holy days and the Sabbath that we do. But this woman was a missionary living overseas, and she was sick. She needed to go to the doctor, and her paycheck didn't arrive, and she, for 30 days, all she had to eat was oatmeal. And at the end of the 30 days, her paycheck finally arrived. She could afford to go to the doctor. And the doctor said, that oatmeal probably saved your life. That was a perfect diet for you to be on. She probably had an ulcer or something. I think at one time, oatmeal was kind of the diet of choice for someone suffering with, with an ulcer. But that's the way God is. I mean, we have to, to wait patiently for him. 
quiet, trusting faith. Psalms 46 and verse 6. Psalms 46 and verse 6. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved, the, the earth uttered his voice, the earth melted. Of course, we know that uh, it speaks of Satan's wrath over in Revelation, the 12th chapter. And uh, this has happened once, and it certainly is prophesied to happen again if you read the context here. And really, oftentimes, what causes the heathen to rage is Satan. That uh, we know, of course, Babylonia that took uh, Judah into captivity, and Syria and uh, uh, Syria that took northern Israel into captivity. And it tells us in Revelation 12 and verse 12, Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you that dwell in them, for woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down from you having great wrath because he knows that he has but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast in the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. So we as God's people will endure that. But we can't lose sight of the fact that God is with us. That he is with us. The Lord of hosts, that word always means armies, is with us. The God of Jacob is our God. You know, it tells us this great insight that Elisha's servant had when they were being attacked by the Syrians, this huge army. And the so it tells us in Second King, uh, King Six, you know, they're surrounded by this great army, and and his servant says, "Well, I said, Master, how should we do? You know, basically, how are we going to get out of this? You know, we're in hot water." And he said, "Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them." Of course, realize there's twice as many angels as there are demons, and uh, that should be, that should be should be encouraging to us. But notice what happens here. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray you open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire ran about Elisha. When they came down to him, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, and I, I pray you with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Great angelic army. My wife, it's a long story, I don't have time to tell it now, but was actually a serial killer tried to capture my wife and our son during was the 80s, right? And, you know, sometimes... We think our children aren't hearing some of what's being said, but my wife said she remembered the ministers when she was a little girl, Tony Hammer, telling them, if you get into a difficult situation, you could call up on the legion of angels. And Jeanette did, and she was delivered. Somebody sarcastically said, well, why couldn't you just call for one angel? That's all you needed. We don't know how many demonic beings might be involved in the machinations of Satan and the devil. Perhaps we might need a whole, a whole army of angels. But it is encouraging to know that, that uh, there are twice as many angels as there are demonic beings. So we don't ever want to want to lose sight of that. I had a note in my Bible somewhere I put in years ago. Oh, yeah. Revelation 5 and verse 11. And, beheld, and I beheld and I heard the voice of, army, of many angels round about the throne and the beast and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. That's uh, 10,000 times 10,000 is 100 million. And, and thousands of thousands, which would be millions. I mean, 100 million angels, that's a lot of angels. And uh, it's probably, just speaking figuratively, 
a great number of angels. But God he wants our eyes to be open to know the great help that we have through his angelic armies. Psalm 46. You begin to wrap this up here. But Psalms 46. Come behold the works, verse 8, of the Lord, and what the desolations he has made. He makes the wars to cease. And of course, we, we read of that prophecy in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 2, where it says, he shall, in verse 4, He shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks, Nathan's nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So a great messianic millennial prophecy there. And sometimes, you know, he can make wars to cease in the church. You recall Paul that brought great persecution upon the church, that he was converted, and then there is there's that statement in the book of Acts that the church had rest. God gave them rest. It won't take time turn to all those scriptures, but certainly it is meaningful and instructive. And it says in verse 10, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. You know, it tells us in the book of Isaiah 26, Verse 3, there was, it was said there was a man by the name of William Gladstone who greatly was a man of great peace, and they asked him his secret. And he said he had these words etched upon his bedstead. Isaiah 26 and verse 3, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. They don't have a word for perfect in the Hebrew, and the way the Hebrew word reads actually, You'll keep him in peace, in peace. They use repetition to, to signify perfection. In peace, in peace. And so, that's the great power of a great resting faith. Can you read that to us again? Read to, uh, okay. Isaiah 26 and verse 3. Oh, okay. Isaiah 26 and verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace. And the Hebrew is, you will keep him in peace, in peace, whose mind has stayed on you because he trusts in you. Very soothing thought. You know, keep him in peace, in peace. And uh, certainly very, very soothing. You know, someone said one time, made this statement that says, you know, look outside and be distressed. Look within and be depressed. But look at Christ and be at rest. And so ultimately that's how we have our peace. Psalms 46, verse 11. Psalms 46, Verse 11, the Lord of hosts or armies is with us. The God of our Jacob is our refuge. You know, that could be a whole Bible study. You know, the, God, the, the very God that was in Jacob's life is our God. You study his life and all the interventions, the intervention he had from, from Esau. It says Salah. Well, that gives you something to think about and to consider. The God of Jacob, the Lord of armies, is with us. Well, certainly, 
Finally, we know we're encouraged in Matthew 28. This great encouragement we have, the marching orders that we have as God's people. Christ's final marching orders, he says, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Go you therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And then he makes this inspiring statement, this great encouragement, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of this world. And he's with us now at the feast, and the river of God's truth will be flowing through his spiritual city, us as God's people, for the next eight days. And truly, God is our refuge. And I hope that you will make Psalms 46 a very special psalm in your spiritual walk and to really be convinced that, that truly God is with us and he is our refuge. Thank you for coming. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them after the Bible study.